Hello and welcome to prune and graft branches on your family tree using source analysis. This is part one of a three part series and I am your presenter, Diana Elder. I'm an accredited genealogist and you can find me at my website, familylocket.com or on the Research Like a Pro genealogy podcast. The content of this video, as well as the thoughts, views, and opinions expressed herein belong solely to the creator and do not necessarily reflect the views of FamilySearch International and Roots Tech. Let's talk about the problem. One incorrect branch in the family tree can result in multiple incorrect ancestors. Our family trees are only as good as each generational link. If one ancestor is not correct, that will result in multiple incorrect ancestors. Without good research, we may have entire branches of our family tree that need pruning out and then new correct branches grafted in. So today we're going to look at an example of my second great grandmother and finding her parents. Her name was Melissa Elizabeth Welch. Let me introduce you to Melissa Elizabeth Welch. When I first started my research, I started with my paternal line and this line followed this pattern. Everyone was in California and then moving back in time, they were in Oklahoma and then Indian territory and then Texas. And from Texas, the lines diverged to all places south. My ancestors were in Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, Missouri. You get the idea. We had a lot of Southern ancestry in this line. And of course, this was all before 1850, so it becomes even more difficult. So when we started working on Melissa Elizabeth Welch, we had to start with what we knew. So what we knew, was some information from the census and death certificates. Let's take a look at what our starting point information was. So we started with the death certificate of her youngest son. Elizabeth Melissa Welch died about six weeks after the birth of her son, Doc Harris. And Doc happens to be my great grandfather. On his death certificate, his mother is named as Elizabeth Welch. In 1925, his sister died. Her name was Devia Harris, and her mother was named as Lizzie Welch. Now moving back in time, the 1880 census of Milan County, Texas, listed a Melissa Harris, who was age 35, born in South Carolina. And before that, in 1870, we have her listed as Melissa Harris, age 25, born South Carolina. So what do you notice about this information? Well, for one thing, we've got a couple of different names. We do have the age about the same, you know, 35 and then 10 years earlier, 25. So that looks good. And a birthplace of South Carolina, which also looks good. That matches. So what is our starting point information? We have Melissa Elizabeth Welch, and we have that she was born about 1845 in South Carolina. This is what we started with. And so if you're going to do some research on this, what would you do? Well, you would probably look for her in the 1850 census in South Carolina, and that is exactly what we did. On that 1850 census in South Carolina, we found an Elizabeth Welch and her parents, well, we suppose they were her parents, were Meredith and Susanna Welch. You'll notice that Meredith is listed a little bit differently on this, and that's because he was on the previous page. Anytime you have a family and you find them at the beginning or the bottom of a census page, always look at the next page to see if there's more of the family. So the age seemed to match. Our Elizabeth, born 1845, would be five in 1850, and born in South Carolina, this looked like a good match. And so we attach these parents of Meredith Welch and Susanna Welch to our Elizabeth. 10 years after attaching the parents of Meredith and Susanna Welch to Melissa Elizabeth Welch, Nicole revisited the research and found a set of alternate parents in George and Lucinda Welch. Nicole's research log shows her progression of research and in part two, we're going to talk all about the records and how this was discovered. With the identification of the correct set of parents for Melissa, 
we have since identified an entire branch of our family tree shown here on the Family Search family tree. Do each of these links need verifying? Yes, and we will continue to do that. But our family tree has changed drastically just because we identified one set of correct parents. Now that you can see the importance of having the correct set of ancestors on your family tree, let's talk about some options for the family tree. Your family tree could be part of a collaborative online family tree. Two examples of this are the Family Search Family Tree or the Wiki Tree. Either one of these lets you add your information to basically a world family tree. And one of the challenges with this is if you add correct information and then someone else changes the information to something that's not correct, that can be a challenge. Which is why you might want to keep your family tree also on a private or a public tree, such as Ancestry. The member trees let you have different settings. You can have your tree be public so everyone can look at it and see your great research. It could be private if you don't want to share some of your information, and it can even be marked to be private and unsearchable so no one can find anything on your tree or any links to any of the images or information you've added to your tree. And the nice thing about an ancestry tree is you can also share it really easily. You can share so people can edit it right along with you or they can contribute to it. Maybe you just want them to be a guest and just look at it. And you can have living people in the tree. However, they will not show up to anyone looking at it except as living. You can see their names, however. And so this can be really helpful if you're trying to connect DNA matches who are usually living to your family tree. Now note that your ancestry tree can be exported as a GEDCOM file and then you can use that to put on other online family trees or to have in a genealogical database. MyHeritage also has family trees and these family trees are much like the ancestry trees where you can invite members and you have various degrees of privacy settings. You also have something called smart matching where you can get some different hints and decide if those hints belong to your ancestor. And this one again you can export as a GEDCOM file. So what are the advantages to having an electronic database in a desktop computer program? Isn't it fine just to have your tree in one of the collaborative trees or just an online tree? Well, let's look at some ideas about why it might be useful to have your own desktop computer program. For one thing, you're going to have powerful features for reports and research tools that the online trees simply do not have. It gives you a chance to store information for living relatives. You may want to be putting in addresses and phone numbers, and you can put that into your personal database. It's available without internet access, and that can be very helpful in case you're researching somewhere and the internet goes out or it's not even available at all. And you can publish and share your tree. You might want to put it on a website, and you can do that with a lot of the programs. And one of the best reasons is that you have full control over your tree. If one of the websites isn't working online, you can still access your tree on your computer. Let's look at some examples of genealogical databases. I'm only going to highlight a few, and there are many, many out there. So first of all, we've got Legacy Family Tree, and this is a great program. It is um, family Search certified, which means you can sync your information with the Family Search family tree. There's also Roots Magic, which syncs with Ancestry trees as well as the Family Search family tree. Then there's Ancestral Quest, which syncs with the Family Search family tree. And there's Family Tree Maker, which is Family Search certified, and it will sync really nicely with your Ancestry tree. So all of these different databases can work with your online trees as well, so you don't have to do duplicate data entry, which is always a good thing. One of the advantages to having your family tree on an online tree, such as FamilySearch, is that you get record hints. 
and these are based on index data, names and dates and places, whatever is showing up for your ancestor. So here you see a record hint from my grandfather, Charles Leslie Schultz, and it's his World War II draft registration card. Whenever you see a hint and it has an image attached, you always want to view the image because the index information will only have a portion of what you can learn about that record and about your ancestor on the image. Now it's really, really important that you take the time to analyze these record hints. Attaching something incorrectly will lead other people down the wrong path as well as perhaps start you on the wrong path of attaching a completely wrong person to your family tree. When we are analyzing these hints, and looking at the record image, some of the things we can do to see if it's really applying to our person is to compare the names, dates, places, and family members. So for this example of the draft registration card, when I clicked into the image, I saw that the person who would always know my grandfather's address was Mrs. Eddie Schultz, his wife, and they were living in Sanger, California. This matched what I knew about my grandfather at this period of time. This was the name of my grandmother. They were living in Sanger. And his date of birth is May 11th, 1904 in Oklahoma also matched what I knew about him. And so I felt very comfortable in attaching this record. And as you go through and analyze the hints that are given to you on Family Search, you can follow the same process. If you don't know much about the person, perhaps you need to step back and look at the other sources on the family tree and analyze those, see if the record hint that's being suggested matches with what is already known and if it's something that you want to include and keep for your ancestor. Ancestry also has hints and these appear as the shaky leaves and this is based on index data and other user tree data. So if someone has attached a record in Ancestry to an individual and you also have that individual in your tree, you might get a hint. Now, just because someone else attaches a record or a photo doesn't mean that matches your person. And so this is where it's really important that we, again, evaluate. And these hints can be good or bad depending on how you use them. In this example, there's a picture of our Melissa Welch Harris and her husband, John Christian Harris. And this was submitted by another user. And I had seen this picture multiple times before and had attached it to my record. But if I hadn't, how great it would be to find that picture. Now let's talk about verifying the family tree. What is our solution to having a good family tree? Well, it is having good research habits. And here are some of the things that we can do. First of all, we can start with what is known. Determine everything that we can about the family. Those are our starting facts. And then we can move back on the family tree, documenting each of the generational links using sources. And perhaps we'll want to start using DNA if desired to verify those links. And we can use the genealogy proof standard as a guide. And the genealogy proof standard was published in genealogy standards by the Board for Certification of Genealogy. And it simply says we should have reasonably exhaustive research. This doesn't mean that you research until you're exhausted. It means you are looking for every record that could possibly give you information about your research question. And then we want to include source citations with our information, with our sources. We want to be able to get back to those sources. Super important that we have a breadcrumb trail so we can look at them again and so can anybody else. Then we want to test the analysis and correlation. So do things fit? Do the pieces of the puzzle come together well or are there some significant data points that are not matching up? And if so, have we resolved that conflicting evidence? And finally, we write a conclusion. And so if we are doing these things, then we can make sure we are doing good genealogy. So that might seem kind of tricky to do all of that, and having a process greatly aids in coming to genealogical proof and determining what information on your tree is sound. 
in my journey to become an accredited genealogist, I realized I did not have a solid research process. Maybe you are like me. I had kept research logs for documents that I found, but I didn't really keep any logs for things I did not find. I had a general plan for research, but I didn't put much thought into it. I learned a little bit about the locality, but not in depth. And I intuitively did some analysis on the records, but not enough. So you may also be doing some of these steps of the research process and maybe you do them in a different order or think of them differently. But this is how I like to work and this is how I teach others on how to do good research. So in part two of the series, we are going to talk all about analysis and how I used the records to make a case for the parents of my Elizabeth Melissa Welch. If you'd like to learn more about what I do, you can find me on familylocket.com and we have a special web page set up for Roots Tech. And you can see the URL at the top of the slide. And there you'll find some templates for a research log and a timeline analysis form. You can find information about the Research Like a Pro Genealogy podcast, our weekly newsletter, our book, Research Like a Pro a Genealogist Guide, and our courses. And so I invite you to go check it out and see how you can learn more. Thanks for watching this presentation of part one of Prune and Graft Your Family Tree. I hope you'll join me for part two, and I hope you'll also check out some of the other great videos as part of this Roots Tech Connect program. Thank you so much.